Excellencies, uh, dear colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm Dominique Burgeon, I'm the FAO Director of Emergencies and uh, Coordinator of FAO Resilience Work. And I'm very pleased to be facilitating this, uh, this panel, uh, sharing the, the floor this afternoon with uh, Excellency the Minister Mariam Kassim, uh, the Minister of Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management of uh, Somalia, as well as uh, with uh, experts from DFID, DAI, and USAID, uh, will be sharing their view on the on the topic. I think we have a, a very good opportunity this afternoon uh, to basically uh, you have all seen the topic and to basically discuss the the, the feasibility and the modalities for setting up uh, social protection. Uh, systems in context of uh, fragility and protracted crisis. Uh, to do that, what we will do in the context of this session is to zoom in on the, on the situation and on uh, what's being proposed uh, in Somalia, uh, with basically uh, the, the government um, having a keen interest to move from uh, short-term emergency assistance uh, to longer-term poverty reduction strategies. I think, uh, as you all know, in the last years, and I would say at an intensified pace uh, since the beginning of the year when uh, Somalia has been uh, unfortunately classified in one of the four countries um, at risk of famine, uh, we have uh, FAO, WFP, UNICEF, and many other partners. Uh, we have uh, been working very closely with the government of Somalia, and we have been mobilizing uh, a variety of tools to provide assistance to the affected population. We have been mobilizing cash, what we call unconditional cash, cash plus, uh, cash for work, and many other uh, solutions. Uh, it's clear that we now have uh, an, an opportunity to, to build on what has been done for these years and as part of the, the humanitarian community working with the government of, uh, of Somalia to really uh, be able to put in place a new system. And I would say the, uh, this is even more so considering that, as you know, since uh, 2012, uh, Somalia has uh, a permanent uh, institution and as we will hear from uh, Excellency the, the Minister, there is no a clear will uh, to move uh, in that direction to basically realize, and there is a recognition from on, on the part of the, of the government that to, to break uh, this vicious cycle of, uh, uh, I mean, poverty, extreme poverty and deprivation, there is a need indeed to uh, move beyond and work on this uh, social uh, protection system. To do that, uh, the, the government of Somalia has uh, clearly included in their national development plan for 2017-2019 uh, uh, social protection as one of the, the pillars on which uh, they want to progress. And I think uh, we therefore have uh, a very good opportunity to hear from the minister, but then to hear from the perspective of uh, various uh, key partners uh, in this effort, how indeed we can support the government effort, of course, knowing that uh, this is not an easy uh, journey, that, uh, that there are challenges that are inherent to the establishment of uh, any social protection system, but even more so perhaps in a in a, in, in a rather complex uh, context. So therefore an opportunity for us to see how we can uh, collectively uh, support the effort of the government of Somalia, but also uh, to learn and, uh, and see how it can be, uh, what we can learn from other contexts and how it can be replicated in other contexts. So uh, to do that uh, this afternoon, uh, we'll have uh, basically uh, four presentations uh, and I will try to ask the panelists to, to keep within their allocated time, even if uh, the subject is uh, 
fascinating and, uh, and, and therefore there is always a tendency to expand and we have seen that this morning and uh, it was very interesting, <laughs> I, I must say. So, so, but I would like to uh, ask them to keep. Then uh, what we'll do after that is that we'll open the floor for questions. So you will have the opportunity uh, to ask questions to any of the panelists and uh, I'm sure this will be a very interesting and, uh, and lively discussion. So, uh, no, it is my pleasure uh, to basically turn to our first panelist, uh, Her Excellency uh, Dr. Mariam uh, Kassim, uh, who is uh, the Minister uh, for Humanitarian Affairs and Disaster Management of Somalia. Uh, Dr. Kassim is a medical doctor, a, a humanitarian and a politician. Uh, she worked as an obstetrician and gynecologist, as well as a university lecturer and a community activist in Somalia, Yemen, the Netherlands, and Great Britain for over 30 years. Uh, she's currently serving as the Minister uh, for Humanitarian Affairs and, and uh, Disaster Management in the federal uh, government since March 2017. But previously, she also served as Minister for Human Development and Social Services and Ministry for uh, Women Development and Family Wel Welfare. So I think when you see her current assignment, but also the previous one, she's definitely the right person to talk on the subject today. So to kick off the, the, the conversation, uh, Excellency, I would like to ask you basically if you could share with us what are the, the motivations uh, behind uh, the decision uh, to move uh, towards uh, establishing a permanent social protection system in Somalia. Uh, how you think we could build on the, on the current drought response uh, that has, as I said, accelerated since the beginning of the year. And, how, and then finally, how these efforts are positioned within the uh, national uh, development plan. So, Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dominique. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulillah. And Excellencies. Well. Good afternoon. Before answering the question of that was just um, that Dominique just posed it, I would like on behalf of my government to extend my gratitude to all those agencies, donors, UN agencies, other agencies, all those who worked with us, that we could avert a famine. In the beginning of the year, everybody was afraid. And we thought that it will be like 2017. But because of the generosity of the donors and also the effort of the agencies that work with us, with the government, in coordination with the government, we succeeded to avert the famine. So it is the faces that I can see across this room, all your agencies joined together with the Somali government that has done possible to avert a famine. Thank you again. And coming to my why now we are really looking to develop a social protection policy. First of all, let me take you to the Somali context. If we look since the fall of the central government in 1991, Somali experienced varying degrees of instability, conflict, and crisis. Clan elders got together in 2000, and by 2004, the transitional government was established. The year 2012 marked the beginning of Somalia's transition away from being a highly fragile country towards rebuilding state institutions. Over the past five years, we have worked hard and there has been a market shift in the political landscape of Somalia. Last year, we had, we held elections of 20, 275 MPs in the lower house, 51 senators in the upper house, and elected a president in February 2017. Our cabinet was sworn into the office in March 2017. 
Our total population is approximately 12.3 million, 42% live in the urban areas, 23 live in rural areas, 26% are, 26 are nomadic, and 9% of the population are internally displaced. We have a very young population where nearly half of our population is under the age of 15 years and three quarters are below the age of 30 years. Approximately 69% of the population lives below the poverty line. Our country is prone to recurrent shocks with both the food and water supplies severely hit by changing weather patterns. Parts of the country plunged into famine in 2011. We were sworn into office in the middle of a humanitarian crisis. As the rainy season has failed for three consecutive seasons, the prolonged drought left more than half of the population in need of humanitarian assistance. We have worked with all our partners to scale up operations and to save as many lives as possible. Again, the formation of this ministry shows you the commitment of the government, that there is a political will, and we as the government, although we are not very strong, but there is the will, and we are really very committed to do something about this situation. Next slide. So why now? Why social protection now? When you look at the Somali history, Somalia has a rich history of social protection, Social protection is a key aspect of the social contract in Somali society, where we provide for the most vulnerable at times of need. Social solidarity and the informal community mechanisms built along kinship, built along kinship lines are the reason Somali households ha has, have been so resilient in the face of so many shocks. These informal community-based social protection systems include support between neighbors, circulation of animals and other assets. It includes zakat, sadaqa, qaran, kalmo. Those are all forms of social protection. Through these informal mechanisms, wealthier households provide money into a pooled fund and it's shared between poor households in the community, or alternatively, the wealthier households provide money directly to the poor households. However, these informal systems are becoming overwhelmed in the face of recurrent droughts. Somalia has the opportunity to build on existing informal systems, as well as the current humanitarian support to develop a formal local, a formal social protection system that shifts the focus to address the root causes of poverty and vulnerability, breaching the humanitarian and development divide and moving away from cyclical reactive <coughs> short-term support. Next slide. Okay, if you look at our national development plan, we have a national development plan. In the plan, when you look at our plan, and the plan lays out the short to medium term strategic direction, development priorities, and proposed implementation mechanism in order to achieve socioeconomic transformation. The National Development Plan consists of six pillars. For among those six pillars, uh, there is a pillar which is the resilience pillar. In this resilience pillar, there is a social protection work group. So social protection is a clear area, goal area, and priority under the resilience pillar. Somalia's National Development Plan sets strong social protection goals and recognizes that social protection is a key role of government in developing the nation addressing inequality and protecting vulnerable citizens. Next slide. Okay, let us see what is being done now. If you remember, I have said, we had just the last four, five years, 
that our government started working because before that there was no permanent federal government and this new government just is existing like six months but lots have been done the last five years in terms of what is already being done at the policy level we have drafted a national disaster management policy to provide a legislative framework for embedding disaster management within the appropriate structures of the government. This will strengthen national capacities for effective disaster preparedness, response, mitigation, and recovery. We have also started the consultative process to draft a national social protection policy that will outline a broad vision for an inclusive social protection system that protects the most vulnerable citizens. The policy will be approved by the cabinet and accompanied with a timetabled and costed implementation plan. At the coordination level, the National Development Plan pillar working groups are facilitating coordinated action by the government, donors, humanitarian and development partners, social protection cities, as a sub-working group under the Resilience Pillar work group, as I said, working group. In terms of humanitarian support, thank you again to generous contributions of the donors. More than one billion USD has been raised since the beginning of the year. Through these, approximately 2.5 million Somalis are being supported with life-saving assistance each month. The majority of this assistance is in the form of unconditional cash and voucher transfers. We have to build on this and transition from the project to a national system. Of course, we also have our informal social protection where approximately 1.4 billion US dollars per year in remittances from the Somali diaspora plays a significant role in providing life-saving community support. Next slide. For us, for Somalia, what does social protection mean? So the definition of social protection for us is simply, in the context of Somalia, a comprehensive government-led national system which will act to protect all groups, in particular the vulnerable against shocks and provide opportunities to overcome poverty. Next slide. Moving forward, there is a significant need versus very limited resources and the capacity. When you look at the needs, it is very huge and the capacity and the resources that we have are very limited which means that moving forward, we have to focus on prioritizing support to the most vulnerable population. We need to secure buy-in at all levels and link to informal social protection. We need to build and transfer knowledge and capacity. We need to link and build on the ongoing humanitarian support for longer term integrated national social protection system. And we need to explore and identify long-term national financing strategies because our biggest challenge is long-term funding and reliable domestic revenue sources. This is also an area where donors can harmonize and pool their technical support and financing in support of a single national protection system instead of doing something here, something there to pool and harmonize. So what are the next steps? To conclude, we will work to transition from short emergency response to long-term predictable safety nets that are shock responses. Our next immediate steps are to develop the social protection policy, increase the capacity, understanding, and develop systems for effective targeting of the most vulnerable, including minorities. And of course, 
institutionalizing those systems through coordination, cross-sectoral linkage, and sustainable financing strategy. What we would like to see is moving from this short-term humanitarian and build more resilient community. I have an example. I'm a medical doctor. Whenever I get a patient in my clinic, this patient can have so many symptoms. For example, say fever. When somebody has fever, it can be malaria, it can be infection, it can be a virus, it can be so many things. So first of all, I have to lower down the temperature and give the patient something, paracetamol simply, or something for lowering the temperature. But that is not the ultimate cure. I have to find out what is the cause of this fever. If it is malaria, so I have to cure the malaria and give the treatment for the malaria. So what I mean is just giving aid in the form of humanitarian, it is just like bringing down the temperature. It is just something temporary. What we need is to see what is the root cause, what is causing this protracted. We cannot be depending on humanitarian aid all the time. So we need to build, come from the humanitarian to early recovery and build a more resilient community. And my request to all our partners, whether they are donors or the implementing agencies, the UN agencies, those who work with us, what I request, my message is, please, we have developed a national development plan. And we have a pillar that is the resilience pillar. And under that comes a social protection work group. Please align to our national development plan and let us coordinate all of us hand in hand so that Somalia can move from crisis and humanitarian stage to more resilient society. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Excellency, for such, uh, I would say, passionate call for, uh, for action uh, for us. I think uh, your, your presentation was uh, very informative. Of course, uh, a lot of, of us are familiar and I would say feel close to, uh, to Somalia, but I think it's very important for you to remind us of the, the challenging uh, context, to remind us that, uh, yes, we are talking of, uh, of social protection in Somalia, but uh, the informal social protection is already uh, very much in place that uh, it has been active, it has prevented many, uh, many people from seeing their, their situation deteriorating further, uh, but that basically it is overwhelmed uh, and that it basically needs uh, to be supported. That I think it's also very interesting to see that, uh, as you say, there is a clear uh, political will uh, a political will that is uh, realistic. I think, of course, uh, you know that there are, uh, that there are many challenges and, and that, uh, as you said, the, the needs versus the resources is something uh, we have to take into consideration and therefore focus on the, the most vulnerable uh, people and then with a, with a clear uh, way forward uh, towards indeed uh, building resilience of these communities. Uh, and I would say that from even our perspective, uh, wearing my FAO hat, I, I, I'm fully in line with your, with your discourse when, when, when you say that basically uh, we need to, to rebuild the livelihood of these people. Yes, it's true uh, in Somalia as well as in the other four famine countries, we are good at preventing famine to occur, but we see that the number of people in severe food insecurity unfortunately keeps increasing. And we know that to address that, the only way is to save life, but also to save livelihoods. And, uh, and as part of that, of course, uh, social protection system supporting uh, the resilience pillar of your national development plan is absolutely uh, critical under, the, of course, the strong leadership of the government. So thank you, uh, Excellency, for your, for your presentation. Now, moving to our uh, second uh, panelist, uh, Rick.
uh, Goodman, uh, DAI Director for Resilience. Uh, it's really my pleasure to, to introduce uh, Rick, uh, who uh, focuses on solutions to extreme poverty and vulnerability in hard to reach areas. Uh, he has directly managed and provided technical assistance to large-scale government schemes, providing cash, assets, and income-generating skills directly to vulnerable families. Uh, Rick has lived in, uh, in many countries, we even met in one of them, uh, <laughs> in Latin America, Africa, and Asia uh, for more than 14 uh, 15 years. Uh, Rick has been team leader for the DAI Managed Hunger Safety Net program in Kenya uh, since 2014. But why we want to talk to you uh, today, Rick, is uh, exactly uh, because of the work uh, you have undertaken uh, in the context of uh, ECHO, uh, DEFCO uh, Commission study. Uh, where you have been uh, working with NISA, who is somewhere in the room and who may want to, uh, to complement as well, on um, uh, basically on a diagnosis, uh, assessing opportunities to build on the current humanitarian assistance uh, to see how we can go towards uh, the foundation of a nascent uh, social protection uh, system. So, uh, what we would like to, to hear from you is what are the preliminary findings of this uh, diagnosis that you have uh, conducted, of course, informed by the presentation of uh, uh, Excellency the Minister. So, Rick, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chairman Dominique, and uh, Excellency Minister Kassim for your uh, very passionate <coughs> and uh, uh, in insightful words. Um, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, Nissa and I were given the opportunity by um, the European delegation and ECHO for Somalia recently um, to make a quick visit uh, to talk to as many uh, uh, development actors, including the government, as we could possibly um, uh, find, uh, including many people who are here in, in the audience this afternoon, I'm delighted to see, um, to come up with some very preliminary recommendations and observations for how to improve uh, and to create the, uh, you know, the, the, a national system for social protection and safety nets uh, that we've been hearing about since this morning's opening session um, uh, until today. And so I feel that we're in a really, we're, we're really in a very good shape to make this happen um, with all the um, uh, pl you know, pleas and requests for making change and improving um, all entirely aligned and mandated for. And this comes down to a real opportunity in Somalia with the formation of the national and federal <coughs> member state governments um, the, uh, and the desire and policy dialogue uh, at headquarters and country level to move <coughs> closely together and create national systems. Um, so here we are in late 2017. We are uh, hopefully now emerging from a severe drought episode. Um, uh, the you know, following 2011, 2016, 17 was also bad, uh, but there's great cause for hope in that um, a, a lot of the coordination and systems uh, were, um, you know, are, are now in place. Um, and the, you know, the, the worst fears were averted. Um, having said that, there is still considerable fragmentation uh, and a, a high degree of you know, poor coordination evident at all levels and on all sides. Um, we, we had a, you know, we, we, we got a clear sense that, um, you know, the, the, there are, uh, there's malcontent at local level uh, for, uh, with recipients of aid. Um, there's a big disconnect between Mogadishu and uh, Nairobi still. Um, and there is also fragmentation between, uh, you know, wh while there is, a, you know, there's a consortium of UN agencies uh, and there are a consortium of NGOs, there are big, there are big uh, communication and coordination challenges uh, you know, on, on all sides. Right. Um, and this certainly needs to be addressed, as I'll come on to shortly. 
Um, uh, at, at, at a local level, I think uh, it, it's, it's difficult to ascertain uh, entirely what the, what the truth is because of issues of access. Um, uh, and, and indeed, programming for aid agencies is immensely challenging, uh, and many, uh, you know, delegate uh, implementation to through third parties, um, and then at the last mile, uh, delegate um, responsibility for for targeting and implementation and monitoring um, to community-based systems. Now, while this is very common uh, around the world, um, it does mean that with limited resources aiming to resolve poverty, which is uh, you know, uh, only, only one part of the uh, stated policy objectives, which in also include vulnerability and exclusion, um, it, it, it often ends up with uh, a small you know, minority of recipients uh, uh, receiving benefits while uh, leaving a great number excluded. Um, it's also at the discretion of the, you know, uh, uh, of the community elite and leadership uh, to decide who ultimately receives benefits. Um, and this uh, you know, really is, a, you know, is, a, is, a, is deeply pro problematic and has driven a perception of unfairness and indeed corruption um, of, of aid actors, and, the, and I'm meaning you know, not only the international actors, but also the national actors. Right? Um, and this is, you know, this is paramount to uh, you know, a need to address. Um, it it, you know, it raises the question of how to use social protection and safety nets, um, not just as a, a, you know, a poverty alleviation tool, or a, you know, and a bureaucratic instrument, but one ha uh, of how one might use uh, a, a, a national system as a, a, a also as a political instrument to create some sense of citizenship and national identity. Um, we heard uh, Stefan Durkin refer to the implement you know, the introduction of a national safety net system in Peru, uh, in the Ayacucho Highlands, um, uh, coming out of a civil war, where the, for the first time. Uh, you know, the, the population was queuing up to receive uh, uh, a state benefit. Um, and this was, you know, this was a remarkable moment in, in Peru's history. Uh, and maybe the same could be done in, in Somalia. Um, could we just move on to the first slide? So I've only got two slides, uh, you'll be pleased to know, this afternoon. And they're both very idealistic, um, but, I hope, but I hope that they're not, uh, not hopelessly naive at the same time. Um, because we are, of course, aware of the immense challenges uh, that, uh, of, uh, of implementing this kind of thing in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in such a difficult context um, will come up against. Um, but so in an ideal world, one would move to much more integrated programming. Um, if, if you are an individual in, uh, in a, uh, uh, a deprived um, community, it's all very well if you're, you know, if you're lucky enough to have a, an aid agency working, providing a, an appropriate program for you uh, and your family well-being at that time. Um, if you're uh, beneath the selection criteria, i.e., you know, if, you, if, the, if there is a public works program or a program that needs one to be uh, productive to be included, um, then if you are destitute and vulnerable, um, you might not be able to participate in that. Or maybe that scheme runs in a neighboring community, but not in your own. And that means that you are, uh, you, you, you want, one might not have access to that uh, appropriate support. Um, so we need to move towards uh, a situation where there is appropriate support available to all uh, uh, la layers or levels of well-being in society, uh, whereby at the bottom you have uh, put chronically vulnerable, long-term destitute might need access to long-term unconditional transfers and associated social welfare support. Uh, but those slightly better off who would be categorized as chronically food insecure um, would need predictable shock responsive transfers plus maybe productive activity through the year. Uh, those a little bit better off would feel the pinch in a, in a, once a year for a few months 
uh, and they would benefit from a different kind of programming. And up at the top, one would need more access to financial uh, and, and market systems. Right? Cutting across all this, we know that uh, cash uh, is not sufficient by itself. There's a body of, uh, you know, of evidence um, from uh, the region that suggests that nutrition and other basic services like water and so on uh, must be delivered in parallel to cash to ultimately reduce uh, malnutrition. Um, so I've put this on the right-hand side of the slide as, you know, as cross-cutting issues of the basic services that we must not uh, ignore. Um, uh, could we go on to the next slide? So looking at this uh, from a national perspective, which is something that we must do, um, we, have, we are in a position, it feels, to plan, think, uh, finance, and monitor at a national scale. Um, this crucially means much closer coordination between uh, the Somali government, federal and state level, um, and the donors, uh, who, uh, you know, and w I mean one, of, one of the phrases that we heard on our, in the round of our consultations was, uh, you know, on a, on a few occasions was my program. Um, this is not acceptable. Uh, we, ha we are here to support Somalia and its government to develop uh, a, a national system. Um, so we are here for Somalia's system or, or at least our program. Um, uh, donor coordination, I think, was key in, in Ethiopia in the, um, the uh, evolution of the uh, productive safety net program. So I'm glad we've got Ethiopian colleagues in the room with us who can give us the benefit of uh, your experience. Um, um, and, and, but others, in, others involved in, in, in that would re, you know, refer to donor coordination as key. Um, this might also need to have a depth of technical assistance um, from experts in the, in the UN or uh, elsewhere, in which case it would be called a, um, a, a development partner coordination team. Um, but together, the donor, you know, ADCT could be providing the leadership, the coordination, the kind of the, the, the policy clearance discussion in relationship with, with Somalia government. Um, we, in this, uh, 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 this uh, green honeycomb uh, uh, um, of issues in the center of the diagram um, are a range of issues that we don't have time to go into in depth here but will all need to be worked through to uh, put in place a national system. Um, we need, a, uh, ultimately, a central bank that provides a regulatory framework for mobile money transfer operators. Um, it doesn't exist. Everything is uh, informal and, and uh, you know, doesn't conform to international legal standards currently. Um, it operates as it is. Uh, but in the long term, that needs to be worked through. Um, Somalia has a very fragmented uh, piecemeal identification, number of systems, um, uh, in, uh, in some for, uh, for different regions, some for different cadres of, 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 of uh, government and military uh, personnel. Um, it needs a national ID framework and system, in the absence of which uh, one might be able to build a, you know, a functional ID system to enable people to reference uh, and register under. Um, but so that we, uh, in the medium term, a functional system, but again, in the long term, one would need a, a foundational um, system. There's been quite a lot of thought given to this already, uh, but we need the resources and the political will to push and put this in place. Um, under that one would need a registration system uh, that is not that is in that is uh, uniform that is independent of uh, the implementing agencies um, uh, and one that is uh, at the request of the national or member state governments that doesn't mean necessarily that all this stuff needs to be 
uh, done by the government, but does need to be at their request under agreed terms. So some, I would imagine some form of public-private partnership uh, being in place there. Um, and that would enable, uh, slowly but surely, implementing agencies to operate under a more of a standardized um, operating framework, under standard operating procedures or SOPs. Um, this doesn't throw out the, uh, the, the need for experimentation uh, uh, done on a, on, a, on a managed basis by implementing agencies, but that would be done in a managed way in, uh, and uh, in such a way that any piloting and experimentation would be feasible to scale up having learned. Um, so we heard from Uganda uh, this morning uh, who have done a number of experimentations with targeting vulnerability, uh, 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 working out what works, what doesn't work so well in, a, in order to inform the scale up to national scale. Um, we thought that uh, third party monitoring that has been in place in the, in the course of the last drought cycle has been very effective. It hasn't always been very wanted, um, but has uh, driven uh, some, of, some of the program quality um, uh, very hard. Uh, and has raised all sorts of awkward questions, um, which are somewhat uncomfortable at times, but absolutely need to be addressed. And um, you know, kind of a, again, a kind of feedback message to uh, you know the donor groups is um, that intellectual honesty uh, and that, that hard work of addressing some of those awkward issues uh, really is very important in the long term to build up a credible system. Um, and so this all gives rise to uh, ability to uh, do what uh, Stefan was uh, uh, imploring us to do this morning, which was um, you know, see, see the, see the uh, social protection and safety net system at national scale, where one can plan, uh, finance uh, sustainably, uh, and determine who owns the risk for management of, uh, the, 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 of a very vulnerable population. Um, there's lots more detail to follow. We are uh, trying to finalize a, a, a shortish paper uh, to summarize our observations. And once we've uh, you know, shared and discussed uh, with yourselves uh, and, uh, and with the uh, delegation, then we'd be happy, I think, uh, on permission to make that available. Um, and. Uh, uh, follow on with the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rick. In preparing for this session, you were telling me, uh, Dominic, uh, use carefully the words preliminary diagnosis, uh, don't raise false expectations. But I see that uh, you have already gone into some, some degree of details in this, uh, in this study. And this presentation was certainly very uh, informative in, in that it has uh, reminding, uh, reminded us of, uh, of a number of, of challenges we are facing currently. I mean, the challenge of, uh, of coordination, uh, UN, NGO, Nairobi, Mogadishu, I mean, all challenges we know, but on which we need to work uh, more intensely. Uh, then you, have, you went into the, the, this uh, review of the, of the nascent uh, social protection system that we want to, to put in place, and uh, highlighting a few, a few key points. I mean, uh, the different needs according to the different categories of population, and also the, this cross-cutting uh, uh, team reminding us that cash is not uh, sufficient, that there is also the basic services uh, that need to be provided to water, cash, uh, water, uh, health, uh, etc. Uh, highlighting the need for uh, more uh, closer coordination between the federal government and the donors, uh, which is uh, which is very important, and reminding of the importance of the ownership uh, of the of the government. And then in, on this last last slide, uh, reminding us basically that there are a number of building blocks that need to come. Uh, together uh, on the road uh, towards uh, a social protection uh, system and elaborating on some of them. So I think this is uh, very informative. I, we certainly look forward for the even more elaborated version of your, of your study. Uh, but thank you again, uh, Rick. Now moving to our third uh, panelist today, uh, Chris.
Chris Porter, who is the DFIT humanitarian head of profession. Uh, Chris, uh, in his position, explores the potential of transitional, some shorter term humanitarian assistance into nascent social protection like mechanism in more fragile context. Uh, he has 20 years of experience in the field, and before joining DFID, he has been working with HCR, OCHA, World Bank, UNICEF, and the Red Cross. So he's been working. You didn't work for FAO, I know. But, uh, <laughs> who knows? <laughs> so, uh, Chris, uh, could you please uh, share with us uh, DFID's perspective on where donors uh, should focus their investment in order to work towards nascent uh, social protection systems uh, in context of extreme fragility. And then uh, DFID has been working around this topic in several countries and what are the main uh, common challenges that you see and uh, that you would like to share with us. The floor is yours. Great, thanks very much. Um, excellencies, uh, senior government officials, colleagues. Um, you'll be pleased now I'm gonna shorten what I'm just gonna say, because I think uh, the minister has already laid out some of the arguments of why we should be doing this much more passionately and clearly than I could have done. I just want, before sort of moving on to some of the questions, I just wanted to lay out sort of two scenarios. Let's imagine ourselves it's 2023. And unfortunately, uh, we're looking at another severe drought event in, in the Horn and Saman has been is being hit. Um, I think if we're in the current situation, we've, so there's been a $1.1 billion, the minister was saying, the response so far, and we're still going this year. This is just so unaffordable. And if we look at the trajectory of humanitarian needs globally and the limited humanitarian pot, which is probably not growing uh, as quickly as it has done in the last few years, we won't probably be able to respond as well as we did this year. And I think you know, ministers laid out the enormous efforts that everyone made uh, to respond this year and, and the whole difference that's made. Um, but, but this is the risk of the status quo. And I think we need to lay that out, out on the line. 2023 could look different if we follow up on some of the work that uh, the minister and Rick have outlined. Um, it could be that we have a more resilient population we could have a cheaper uh, response that is more affordable and potentially that responds even quicker than the efforts that happened in January. Um, so just to sort of, uh, we, we need to have this motivation that it's, it's not, uh, we could just carry on and it will be fine. Um, and I think what also saying, with, how that would look in 2023 is hopefully we'd have a more resilient population, but we would also have this mechanism that might be able to respond to the shocks. It doesn't mean that there would be no humanitarian short-term effort. Let's be honest and realistic about how this would work. There would probably still need to be some sort of complementary activity, um, but we wouldn't be relying entirely on that for everything. Um, and just if we, uh, it's brilliant that colleagues for, from Ethiopia are here, you know, it doesn't sound like much, but it's an enormous achievement. I was reading, um, so uh, PSMP, Ethiopia uh, PSMP um, clients, their, their food gap has reduced from, I think it's three months in 2006 to 1.75 months in 2014. It's not massive, but it's huge really when you think of the numbers of people the government is, is reaching in Ethiopia. Um, so now I'm moving on to your, your questions, which, um, whether it's Somalia, but other in-crisis contexts, um, I liked the, the challenge to Stefan uh, from the colleague in Burundi this morning, which I'm not sure Stefan <laughs> it totally addressed. Um, what are some of these bottlenecks and challenges and, and how can we address them? I think we've got to be really honest, we don't entirely know yet. Uh, and you know, I'll be interested in, in comments from the floor uh, and, and advice because we're still trying it. Um, but anyway, here, here's some of the bottlenecks uh, and, and uh, where we see things. So firstly, um, there is a political question for donors that our appetite to work towards such systems uh, where there's little short-term likelihood of sustainable domestic or national financing. So this is quite a tough one. Um, I think where it's made easier is in the example that the minister has given where you've got a government that's politically right behind it and pushing it themselves. That is a huge, huge help. Where I'm challenged is, unfortunately, we're not in that context in all the other places where we have massive humanitarian responses. And, 
uh, how do we, uh, as donors, convince our taxpayers um, that this is still a good thing to do? And maybe there's some more work that needs to be done on showing that the massive, uh, I would hope it's almost enough, that the, the sort of benefits to the people that are suffering in terms of their resilience and reduced suffering, but also the massive value for money arguments. Uh, and I don't think we've crunched those numbers sufficiently yet to show that if we did have something like this in Somalia or in other places where the government's not quite there, uh, um, so behind it, that it would save us a lot of money, money that we could spend elsewhere. Um, and I think, yeah, Stefan said this morning, um, you know, it, it might smell like s social protection, but it's not. And, and it is, for me, fine. Where we can work towards a proper social protection system with a government right behind it, with a clear trajectory, uh, that's wonderful. But that's not going to be everywhere. That doesn't mean we, especially from the humanitarian side, that's, we therefore don't do much. Well, I think if it smells a bit like social protection, well, that's, that's progress. Um, and um, uh, so maybe we'll talk about that a bit more later. Um, Secondly, uh, Stefan mentioned this morning this issue of uh, um, countries affected from conflict. It's not always, unfortunately, a, a, a uniform trajectory uh, forward in terms of peace and stability. And we've got to have these sort of resilient systems. I think we've got, I'm not sure if we're hearing in plenary, but you know, interesting example from Yemen, where the, the registry from the, from the SWF, the Social Welfare Fund, is still being used now. And that's, I think that's a brilliant thing for those people who worked on, on creating that. Um, uh, so thinking through, through that as we move ahead. In Somalia, this may also have, or other contexts, it may also have implication, implications when considering how we communicate this effort of, of creating these systems. Is it a state building agenda? Or actually, are we just trying to get much more effective assistance to really, really vulnerable people? And, and what the minister laid out, I think, which really nicely on the Somalia example is, in the smart it's so rooted in cultural tradition that hopefully if one can align with that, uh, it may be more resilient even if there's some uh, disruption uh, and, and different sort of political or even military uh, uh, control in the area. Thirdly, um, and Rick has laid this out quite clearly, to achieve the scale and coverage and efficiency uh, desired, we need to work together, not individually. And there will be m big trade-offs and compromises in some of these, uh, and tensions in these design issues, whether it's on targeting, whether it's on payment levels, delivery channels, um, and also I think uh, whether there will be this focus on developing a core system that's just routinely assisting people, or whether straight away you try and make it shock responsive, as we saw all the, the bells and whistles on, on the really exciting work that's been done in Kenya with the HSMP. But that is, it, it's, you know, do you go simple or do you bolt on some of these other things which uh, potentially are more complicated but could have a massive impact? Um, I think, you know, these considerations are needed in more stable contexts, but where we've got this sort of greater fragility, conflict risk and less, uh, less capacity, uh, including amongst the agencies who are trying to help, uh, it, it just really brings these things to the core. Um, and also, we all have, I guess, from our institutional perspectives as development humanitarian partners, we all have our own institutional interests or mandates, and uh, we're going to need to be willing to compromise. And what the minister's been quite clear, you know, where you have a national government like Somalia, they expect and demand objective advice from their partners, um, which is clear that the government the minister's not going to let you off the hook if you don't do that in Somalia. What do we do in those contexts where we don't have that leadership from the government? Are we willing as uh, development humanitarian partners to uh, have that sort of forum and those discussions where that can happen? And, and where does that happen? You know, in Somalia, it's very clear. We've got the National Development Plan and the Resilience Pillar. There's a forum. Where do we do that in these other places? Um, and because uh, we're talking here about a longer term planning process. This is not an HRP one year, three year Thing. This is a, maybe a five, ten year vision of which you then could break it up into smaller planning cycles. But uh, I think that that's quite an interesting challenge of where, where do we do that uh, and coming together. Um, 
also just uh, what we've found on when we've looked at how we're at least how we're doing on this in a few places huge issues of, of human capacity for us to drive this forward um, Stefan gave us a hard time for not moving this agenda forward in South Sudan uh, part of that might have been you know the sort of political direction of what was happening in Sudan post CPA but I think there was also people were running the humanitarian guys were running a million miles an hour on on, on, on the crisis they didn't have time uh, often they have willingness but not enough time to step back and and, and, and and look at this potentially not enough development actors there either to, to sort of drive this forward and so I think that um, Rick's laid it out for Somalia but can we have some sort of dedicated capacity that works for the benefit of, of all rather than a single agency a single donor and, and, and is tr a trusted arbitrator of, 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 um, uh, of that sort of advice that brings it to a decision-making group so a, a big thing thing for me on, on capacity um, we've covered I think already the sort of the basic transfers alone certainly won't make people resilient. Um, there's a, a nice piece of research uh, from Somalia which really lays this out on the line. Um, it's called the Rifani. And it just, uh, yeah, it, it, so cash assistance by itself was insufficient to tackle wasting, uh, reduce wasting. Uh, and uh, with health service provision, absolutely key, even when food insecurity was typically viewed as the key driver of the problem. So um, yeah, Rifani, if anybody wants to look up that piece of research. Uh, so we need to be thinking cash plus, whether that's uh, ensuring access to more productive livelihoods, which I think uh, my colleague from the US will, will speak on in a second, uh, or basic services, or more fundamentally just safety and security and avoiding being forcibly displaced. Um, and finally, we need to be honest and realistic. Uh, uh, Somalia, again, because we have this sort of government drive, but this will take time. And, and progress will not be linear. Colleagues from Kenya or Ethiopia who are here, they've worked so hard after over the last 10 to 15 years in, 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 in potentially much easier context, and it's still evolving in, the, in, in those areas. So we need to be honest about how long it takes. Um, but also be ambitious. Um, certainly from the DFID side, we're working in Somalia. Um, we have uh, multi-year multi-year efforts where we're trying to see how our humanitarian support could evolve into something that looks a bit more like a nascent safety net and work behind the government leadership um, but I guess again the clock is ticking I think for those of us uh, so I worked uh, like many others who are probably here in uh, on Somalia in 2011 so you feel the famine happened on my watch there were lots of reasons uh, the compounding factors that caused the famine but you feel it, my goodness, 260,000 people died. It's horrific. Um, so there was a real momentum straight after that. And I see some people here who also did some diagnostics on safety nets just after that. And there was a bit of momentum, but we never, we never got the traction. We never got it going. Now the time is different. We have a government who's fully pushing for it. And I think 2016, 17, there's even more momentum. So much work was done with two and a half million people receiving regular assistance each month. Uh, there, there, there's lots that can be built on there. Um, so we've got to retain the memory of 2011, build on the momentum of uh, this year, 2016, 17, and ensure that 2023 is different. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chris, a very, very informative presentation, and I think you had a number of keywords. We need to be honest, realistic, ambitious, and uh, we need to build on the momentum. You re-emphasize the importance of the, the political will, the political leadership that we need to support, a leadership that we don't have in all the countries where we are uh, working. You, you pointed to the, to the issue of human capacity, which is uh, certainly very important and which perhaps we didn't address uh, sufficiently. Uh, also, the, the value for money argument, which I, I think is very important uh, and for which we need to, to clearly build the evidence to convince that indeed it would be important to have this sort of long-term investment uh, you, you, you refer to that are way beyond uh, the HRP type of, uh, of uh, time frame that we are talking about. So thank you very much for your, for your presentation. Now, uh, moving to our fourth and last panelist, I'm, I'm sorry you are the last, but... I'm not the least, for sure, and, uh, and uh, I'm pleased to, uh, to introduce uh, 
Joseph Chege, who is from the, the USAID East Africa uh, mission. Um, Joseph uh, has extensive experience in the formulation and implementation of emergency food security program, and in the last year he has been working on the design and implementation of large-scale uh, cash transfer program uh, funded by USAID uh, Food for Peace uh, to prevent famine in Somalia. Uh, no, Joseph, the, my, my question is the following. Um, USAID working with both uh, OFDA and uh, Food for Peace program is definitely an important player uh, when it comes to cash-based intervention in, uh, in Somalia. Uh, and it's working to, to prevent famine and enhance uh, social cohesion. How do you see these interventions uh, for building longer term livelihood resilience and thereby starting a virtuous cycle uh, for economic and social development. Yeah. The floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Your Excellencies and uh, ladies and gentlemen. I'm here pleased to share with us uh, some of our experiences as uh, USAID, uh, being the largest humanitarian donor in Somalia, uh, on how we see the cash-based interventions uh, from our own perspective and how we can learn from them. So basically from, uh, it, from, from the current farming response, uh, we as, a, as USAID have been running one of the most uh, huge program in terms that re is responding to this uh, crisis. And this is in acknowledgement to the critical role the cash, you know, play in terms of uh, ad addressing emergencies like famine and, uh, and, and drought and to protect, you know, livelihoods and also to meet the immediate uh, human immediate food needs of vulnerable people. And uh, for example, in the, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in the last few months, we've been programming around 150 million US dollars that have been reaching around 1.2 million people in a, in a month at the peak of the response, meaning that uh, we have seen the value of what uh, cash-based intervention can do. And this is, again, in recognition that cash is a fast and effective uh, means of addressing acute uh, food insecurity. And uh, from USAID perspective, cash-based intervention and how we see them, they not only uh, are effective in addressing these emergency uh, food security needs, but they can be used to even tackle underlying um, issues of, of, of vulnerabilities. And and uh, the minister has given us that context very well, which I do not need to repeat. And uh, in practice, um, what does this mean? And uh, from us, we, I, can, I can give examples from uh, two programs that, we have, we, 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 that have been ongoing, especially in this moment of farming prevention, uh, through like, uh, for example, Cash for Work, uh, which has been mentioned even from the earlier session in, in the day, uh, where payments are made to households who are doing product, who are creating or rehabilitating, you know, productive asset. And from what we've seen, these assets uh, support the drought affected communities, you know, to protect their livelihoods and also enable uh, production. And just like uh, what you've mentioned, these work opportunities that uh, cash, like example of this condition of cash programming gives, it, it helps and enables uh, rural communities who could otherwise be displaced to remain in their communities, thereby, you know, enhancing social, um, enhancing um, that there is social, in, uh, people are, ha have social in interactions, and not only more than that, making sure that the social ties remain together. As we know, the current uh, drought has almost displaced uh, close to 900,000 people in Somalia, and uh, were it not for some of these programs that uh, we are running currently, the displacement could even have been much more, uh, as we, we saw earlier in the year when uh, the pre-famine conditions uh, were declared. And again, um, uh, from another program, which I think Chris has mentioned about it, the Cash Plus program, and uh, from our end, we see it as a very innovative
innovative way of using cash, uh, cash as response, uh, where you currently what we have is around 240,000 people being given unconditional cash transfer combined with a livelihood, an emergency livelihood package in form of farming inputs and in form of uh, maybe like fishing kits and, 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 so, and, 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 and many others. And uh, this livelihood component of this uh, cash plus program, you know, uh, provide a time critical support uh, to rural farming communities. And this is an agro-pastoral communities. And these are the very key people that we need to address such programs too. And from what we've seen by provide by combining these two, that is cash and also an, a livelihood component, we have we have a household who is able now to feed themselves and also to feed two additional families for, for, for six months. And again, uh, this means that uh, through these two programs, the cash plus cash for work, which have been mentioned like smelling like a cash trans like a, like a social protection program, we have seen that there are wide ranging possibilities, you know, to benefit local markets, to benefit local economies, and even to reestablish uh, livelihoods. I would like to uh, draw your attention to one of the slides that I have, which is only one, so uh, you can be sure I'll not take wrong. And I will just show how, you know, cash-based intervention can be used as a catalyst or the benefits that emanate from cash plus cash-based interventions like in the context of Somalia, how they can be used to, you know, you know, to offer wide-ranging benefits to local economy, to uh, social development, where a predictable income in form of uh, the cash-based intervention can generally improve uh, the, the welfare of a household, better health and education, better food security. And again, like I've mentioned, even the work opportunities that comes with, the, for example, cash for work program helps to avoid much more displacement. Already we have a protracted uh, caseload of uh, now close to uh, two million people who have been displaced because of such, of drought and famine. If we are able to implement such program and avoid that, and uh, eventually we are creating a more resilient society. And like I've mentioned, even the assets that are being able to, that, that are being created by the households involved in such programs, not only uh, uh, contribute to higher productivity and uh, livelihood diversification, which again, all of it contributes to long-term resilience of these uh, communities that we are working with. And I want to say this, these are the same benefits that we can expect when we have a large scale and longer term social protection program. And by so doing, I, especially in the context of Somalia, and maybe the, my, the people who are, who are familiar with the context of Somalia can agree with me, we do not have to start from a scratch or from zero. We know that the, these cash-based interventions from 2011 to the Respond to drought and famine have been going on, and they offer very clear, you know, very good examples of how we can even now scale up. For example, we have, you know, many beneficiaries now registered biometric through biometric system, meaning that even in the absence of uh, at least a, a, a national ID system, which uh, Rick was referring to, we still have found a way of how we can make sure that we have people in a database receiving these, uh, you know this assistance and again from there on we we, we also know that uh, it, like what the minister referred to that you know we have just managed to avert a famine in Somalia and this is in part you know to, thanks to the cash based intervention where we are reaching now like 2.5 million people in a month however if these gains that we have made I, I think that they need to be protected and they need to be protected and an opportunity exists in transitioning cash-based interventions in such a context into a more large-scale social protection uh, program. And like I've said, there are key ingredients in the current cash-based interventions that are quite clear, or the model of uh, a longer-term you know, longer social protection can, can, can borrow from.
platform, including things like even the targeting criteria, uh, where we have a very robust targeting criteria thanks to a very strong social you know, ecosystem that exists in Somalia. Even being able to reach beneficiaries using uh, m mobile money, which is also another eco ecosystem that has uh, been very resilient even in the face of such uh, disruptions that we, we are working with. So again, I, I, I believe that we do not have to start from zero. We have a basis in what we are currently doing. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, uh, Joseph, for sharing the, the broad uh, USAID experience in cash-based intervention in, in Somalia and for uh, highlighting the importance of a number of mechanisms uh, that have been put in place and that are now uh, becoming more and more used, such as the, the cash plus modalities, which is indeed uh, very much related to, to what, uh, what other speakers were talking about, that the cash is important, but that other dimensions need to be added. Uh, you you refer to, uh, to uh, livelihood support, which is obviously very important. And for making the point that obviously on building on this, that we have a strong basis with this cash-based intervention to transition towards a longer-term uh, social protection system. So thank you for that. So now we have about 15 minutes. Uh, until the end of this session, and I would like to, uh, without any further delay, to, to open the floor and, uh, and ask you to, to put your questions to the, to the panelists, uh, whom I'm sure will be keen. So I see one there in the back. If you could please introduce yourself and, uh, and, uh, and, then, uh, and then ask your question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I'm uh, Jeremy. I work for UNICEF in Burundi, and I asked the, uh, the difficult question this morning. Uh, this one is, I hope, less difficult, but it's more technical in nature. I, I we've talked. Everybody's mentioned the cash plus, and we are, you know, obviously we stand fully by that as a as a as a much better approach than just cash. However, I want to bring uh, bring up the the question that we also discussed with the deputy minister from Ukraine on social work. Now, most people, when they talk about cash cash plus, they're not talking about social workers and the referral pathways uh, for the most vulnerable. Uh, and I, I believe that if we're trying to move away from cash as an as a, as a input into a response to a humanitarian crisis, uh, even with Cash Plus, we, we risk not making that full transition to a more development-orientated social protection um, system. So I'm, the question, if you like, uh, apart from just raising the, f the fact that we, we, I believe we need to be talking more about the social work component, perhaps to, to Minister Qasim and then maybe to, uh, to Chris or, uh, or uh, any of the other panel members, is, is it realistic in a context such as Somalia to invest now in social work and social workers? I know there's some very limited work already going on, but it is very limited. And then the question to, uh, to, to Chris or to any other panel members is, is it realistic to expect uh, the, 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 the bilateral, multilateral donors, and I'm not expecting, by the way, a commitment from, from DFID or anything like that, but is it, is, it, uh, is it appropriate to expect them to start investing in what I believe is a crucial component of a social protection system, regardless of where we are in terms of humanitarian crisis? Thank you. Okay, thank you. Perhaps we can take a few questions and then uh, give an opportunity to the panelists. I see there the lady here in the front. Oui, euh, merci. Euh, je vais intervenir en français, s'il vous plaît. Euh, je suis well, I'd like to speak uh, French, if you don't mind. My name is Irénée. I'm the general manager of social protection in Madagascar. And I have two questions for you. The first question is for um, the minister of Somalia. What about the coordination? <coughs> because you had to coordinate uh, the Social Protection Fund. And in Madagascar, we decided to design a new law about uh, social protection. And we decided to uh, support it uh, yesterday at the level of the Council of the Government. I, I don't know whether it has been approved or not. But during the negotiation process, we did get in touch with all the stakeholders, the working group on social protection, the different working groups of the ministries and the government, and it created a huge debate, actually, because we decided to set up a common fund on social protection. And my question is the following. How 
did you manage to coordinate the fund on social protection? So that's my first question. The second question has to do with harmonization, harmonization in design. Well, let me take uh, the example of the amount of money, the targeting uh, of the different uh, populations. I would like to know how you did manage to harmonize all that, because it's a, um, quite, it means quite a lot of work. It's time consuming, because we also have in Madagascar a cash transfer group, which has regular meetings, and we try to have a better harmonization in terms of amounts of money. And we know that it has created a, a huge debate as well. Yeah, my name is uh, Kai Röhm. I'm with the World Food Programme, currently based in the DRC. I have two questions, um, specifically not to Somalia, because the Somalia response was a drought response, but when, I, when we look at the agenda and also the title, and we look at social protection systems in context of protected crisis and also fragility and forced displacement, I wonder how can we actually reinforce systems when the state might be part of the conflict? Um, because then, you know, you have an issue of neutrality, you have an issue of, you know, does, does, does state systems be, be accepted at all, 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 by all parts of the, the community? So I think, you know, this is why specifically not to Somalia, but to the panel itself. And a second question, this is more also maybe for my FAO colleague. Um, although I understand it's the, the cash-based transfers uh, used for Somalia, I just can't reconcile that we're having a drought which means under production, which means maybe a food deficit country, and then we're intervening with cash that will, you know, put a lot of pressure on the actual existing supply. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, let me take one question there, yeah, the lady there. And then we open for a first round of, of responses. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for all the interventions. Um, I'm Jessica from Save the Children. I'm a, so a civil society actor. Um, and the question would be um, that actually uh, civil society is pretty important in humanitarian action, but it's also instrumental in the design and management of uh, social protection schemes. Um, and actually the question I have is w uh, where you see the value added of the civil society actors in Somalia but also in places with uh, less of uh, government leadership, maybe for Chris. Okay, thank you very much. Madam Minister, do you want to start or your, or your colleague from the ministry? Uh, I will give to my colleagues from the ministry, but the last question about cash-based transfer. Yeah. I, I would like okay. to go to that, then I will give to okay, my Okay, so you start with that? From, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. We'll give that one. Um, uh, the question is, is, a country like Somalia, okay, when you look at the context, when, when we have a um, shortage of rainfall, it affects the agrobastral community and the nomadic community. So those droughts, there is a complete collapse of the animals, livestock, and the agriculture. But there is one thing remaining for us, the market. The economy depends on the market. There was never food shortage in Somalia. Food is everywhere, but we don't have, what, what we lost is the purchasing capacity of the citizen. There is food everywhere, rice, oil, Beans, all food is there. The market's working, but this simple IDB or uh, the vulnerable people, they lack the purchasing capacity. So when you give them cash, it is the best way to assist. I myself, and I went to visit in remote areas like Waji, Dolo, I want to visit those areas to see myself how the response was going and what people are getting. The, uh, starting from the registration, the minute they get the scope card from WFP, went to the shops to see how they purchase and when they put the fingerprint, and I asked the people. 
most, maybe like more than 20 people, I ask them the question, do you prefer food or cash? All the answer was coming cash. Because they said when you have cash, you can buy whatever you want. A woman gave me the example, I can buy eggs, I can buy onion, I can buy, but when you get just a rice or sorghum or you don't have many choices. So the food is there, the market is full, just so they can't buy it. So the other questions maybe my colleagues can, Mohammed. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I saw the panelists who are going to answer all the questions. <laughs> uh, I, I just want to give a, a quick overall um, uh, answers to some of the general questions and I leave to the panelists who have some of the direct questions to, to answer. Uh, just to give a little perspective uh, about the context in Somalia. Um, um, you know, during the, the, the drought crisis, uh, a lot has been learned. And, and what has been learned was that um, uh, together uh, with civil society, and, and that's the question I also want to address, the civil society uh, role uh, in, in Somalia, uh, together with the elders, with the women groups, and with the diaspora. Uh, you know, for, for a long time, we have seen the most coordinated uh, you know, effort in response to the crisis in Somalia, and that is something that I think was learned during uh, the last five to six years since 2011. Uh, and, and, and the minister earlier mentioned that uh, we managed to avert, uh, you know, a full-blown, um, you know, famine. Uh, we, we were able to do that now because people realized the importance of coordination. And the importance of coordination from the uh, donor side, uh, you know, my colleague now from the USID was talking about a lot. Uh, about um, you know databases, uh, a lot about in investments, uh, short and, and, and long term uh, you know investments in the rural uh, IDP uh, nomadic populations. Um, now we have even uh, very strong um, you know civil societies uh, like uh, informal ones like Awi Walal and other groups that somehow managed, you know, to create such a momentum. They did not raise a lot of money, but uh, they were very loud in terms of, uh, you know, getting the, the entire attention uh, of, of the world. And, and thanks to those coordinated efforts, um, I think I would say that we learned uh, a, a big lesson, a big lesson that I think now should be built on, uh, you know, built to be open in, in the next few years. Um, one of the main challenges that uh, a lot of you have already mentioned is that, um, is that um, you know, the, the need of uh, evidence-based, uh, you know, information is very, very important, data. Um, and uh, to some of you that uh, already work in the context of Somalia, you know that there is plenty of data already. But the problem is that the data sometimes is unharmonized and, and uncorrelated. Uh, so th there is a need of, uh, of, 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 of gathering that uh, information into one main um, database. The, the other area that we need to improve, I think, is the fittings and the alignments uh, of the different stakeholders. Uh, now, uh, you know, Somalia is like federal um, uh, state, and those federal states, uh, uh, you know, have different way of administrations. So some of the areas are still inaccessible, but sometimes you would see some of the donors and some of the government-run operations concentrate in one area, sometimes to do with the insecurity, sometimes not to do with insecurity. And then you would see uh, a small town with a population of maybe 200 or 500 households receiving so many different donors and stakeholders instead of spreading that out. And, and that's also uh, an, an area that, 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 that the government uh, will be improving on. In terms of innovation, uh, we were able to do this uh, because of the vibrant um, uh, you know, businesses and the private sector of Somalia, the innovation of technologies, the mobile technologies that somehow replaced, um, replaced the, 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 the registration and, and ID systems in a way. Uh, it, it cannot replace, uh, we know that, but in reality now it has become the primary key identifier for most of the population. Your, 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 your mobile number is everything. 
uh, and uh, for us it means a lot but now it bears to the next question which is like how do we utilize and make uh, use of the big data okay like uh, now we have uh, 70 or nearly 80 percent of the entire Somali population owning uh, a mobile phone especially those in the nomadic populations so how do you track all that information uh, is, is also very important so thank you okay thank you very much Yes, please, uh, Rick. Um, so to, to respond to um, Jeremy uh, on, on uh, social welfare, um, Chris mentioned the, um, the, the, you know, the discussions and the push uh, after 2012 to you know, discuss and, and, and uh, you know, design and implement a, um, a, a more systemic approach. Uh, one, of, one of the best bits of work that came out of that discussion, I think, was commissioned by UNICEF, uh, author is in the room, take a bow, Gabby. Um, uh, 2014, uh, I can't remember the, what the title was, but an, an, an exploration of um, uh, you know, poverty and vulnerability in Somalia um, uh, with uh, a, 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 an NGO, a national NGO, uh, doing field research. Um, and the, you know, the, broadly, the conclusion was focus on vulnerability rather than poverty. Poverty, poverty is generally considered 70% of the population. Everybody's poor. Um, it's not possible if you've only got enough resources to target 20% of the population. It, you're leaving 50% of people who are poor uh, excluded from your program. Um, so, you know, you know, please consider focusing on vulnerability. You'll be gratified to have seen uh, a long-term conditional cash transfer on my slide coupled with social welfare support. Um, and one thing that would help do that, uh, as uh, Mohamed um, Mualim has just said, is you know, registration systems that are interoperable. So if you have a single registry that is under the government, but independent and central, you can run all sorts of other, other referral systems from that. I mean, as, as, as to the timing and the prioritization, I think we'll have to go and uh, fight that out together in the corridor afterwards. I mean, it's, uh, it, it's prioritizing welfare rather than food security and nutrition. Uh, I, I would argue for introducing it now in uh, whatever stage of a, uh, of a crisis that we're in. It's, um, it, it's ignoring it not to do it. Okay, thank you, uh, Rick. Now moving to Chris, and then to Joseph, to add something. Um, I'll just say, uh, the, the colleague from DRC, I mean, uh, for me, this is the rub. This is the, the, the key question, what do we do in these contexts uh, that you outlined? And I, I think this is where the, there's more pressure on us as sort of predominantly humanitarian actors, but hopefully also some development actors in that space to take it upon ourselves to try and move forward as much as we can. Um, and in terms of what does that mean in terms of government leadership, well, I, I guess it, the, I'm not going to use the word a continuum, but um, in some places there probably won't be any government engagement. In some there probably be a little bit. In some places there probably be a lot. I think there'll have to be that flexibility to evolve uh, as and when it makes sense. In some places national government engagement might be quite tricky but you might be able to engage subnationally um, uh, at a technical level rather than at a sort of very political level. But so I think this is, that's going to be one of the most challenging places. I think as a development donor, we're probably not going to be driven to a process where there's a, uh, you know, a, a government with very contentious legitimacy who's not, who's part of the conflict and causing the problem that's, uh, um, that we're trying to address through some sort of station. So I think there will have to be, it's just going to have to be a very nuanced piece, but when there's an opportunity to engage with government, and it's the right time, we've got to grab it, but it's just that, it's that sort of flexibility, which is going to be hard for us, um, but that's not a great answer, but I think that's, that's the solution. Thank you very much, Chris. Joseph? 
Yeah, if I may, um, I would just mention something small on the question that have been asked or some about the cash plus program. And to add to uh, what uh, Honorable Minister has already mentioned, the fact that uh, we we have the cash plus program having a, a conditional cash part of it and a livelihood component, meaning that the markets are working and that's why people are able to utilize these are part, the unconditional cash transfer part. The livelihood component is uh, clearly targeted to some uh, to some livelihoods, like I've mentioned, the farming communities that could be having access to maybe to irrigation water, but they don't have the means of the farming input, or even to fishing communities that are still vulnerable in the time of drought. Meaning, even in a time when uh, the, 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 the whole country has been devastated, we still have pockets of uh, livelihood zones that could still benefit from these inputs and that's why the, the added and the added value we have seen as USA in this program is the fact that we are able to even start assuring people of food security even in the time of uh, such crisis. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joseph. Unfortunately, I think we are already five minutes behind the, the time, so I think we need to, uh, to close the discussion. There are still many questions to be asked. I realize and I feel very embarrassed that that side of the room got more opportunity that, than that side, so I apologize for that. Uh, we'll do better next time. I think it was, uh, it was certainly a, a very uh, interesting conversation. I mean, we have learned a lot. I think we are all uh, reassured and confident that with the, this degree of, uh, of political commitment from the government, uh, this is definitely a doable endeavor. I think uh, we, always, we also have to be realistic about it. It is not something that will happen overnight. This would be a long-term uh, endeavor, uh, and uh, indeed, uh, but I think we can reach uh, that point. So I would like to, first of all, thank the, the panelists uh, for their very clear uh, presentations, and at the top of them, the, the minister, uh, who is leading this effort, and then the participants, and again, apologize if you didn't have any op enough opportunity to, to engage with the, with the panel, but now is the coffee break, and I'm sure you can follow up uh, in that context. Thank you very much.